Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name's Alec McCutcheon from Unicom. We're delighted to be hosting this afternoon's webinar, which is on the theme of Automate More and Script Less for Continuous Delivery. Our presenter this afternoon is Billy G. Kiefer, who's Advisor Solution Strategy at CA Technologies. Billy has over 35 years' experience in system network, database, and application management across mainframes, Unix, Linux, and Windows platforms. So he's got a great deal of experience and real life knowledge to share with you today. So what I'm going to do is just mention a couple of items that are at the webinar, so at the end of the webinar, and also during, if you have questions, please feel free to type questions, and we'll be taking them at the end. And just also to remind you that there is going to be a draw right at the very end after questions for winning an iPad. So everybody who stays on at the end is eligible to be in that draw. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Billy. Right. Thank you very much and welcome everybody um, to the um, afternoon uh, webinar for Automate More and Script Less for Continuous Delivery. As I was saying, my name is Billy Kiefer and I, I work for CA Technologies. I'm sort of advisor of solution strategy, working with our, uh, our automation and release automation tools. So we'll go ahead and get started. So we've done a number of, of presentations, and uh, me and another colleague, and we tend to use this slide to sort of get us kicked off. And it's an important slide to the point where, you know, it, it sort of sums up where IT is at today, because the, the business is constantly demanding. And you'll be happy to know, you know, that hasn't actually changed. You know, it's constant, 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 you know, speed up, speed up, speed up. Um, the reliability, you know, I want it to work 100% of the time, and I want it to work exactly how I think it should be working that 100% of the time. And then, then the business is talking about, you know, complexity. You know, what complexity? You know, from, from their side of view, from their point of view, you know, I have an iPad. Uh, you know, I've got a couple of icons in my iPad. You know, I tap an icon, you know, how simpler can that be? So we're, we're, at, we're faced with a situation where the IT is basically saying, right, you know, do I, do I move faster? You know, what's the risk of moving faster? Or maybe I should slow down because, you know, the business is saying, you know, I need quality, concentrate on quality. But we really reach the stage where, you know, we need both. We need, we need faster, we need speed, and we need that quality. So that's what's actually driving the business down to the IT department. So when you think about it, you know, the application is king. And as we all know, if we're in the, in the, sort of the IT industry, things are complex and things are very dynamic. They become very complex because, you know, as I said earlier in the introduction, you know, I've been in IT for over 35 years. And one of the things I've, I've, I've grown to, to learn and to know is the fact that IT Nobody throws away anything. You know, we, we keep it all. It, it, it serves a purpose. Uh, and, and that's what makes it more and more complex. And the key to everything is the application, as we all know. Without applications, we've basically got a very, exp a very expensive heating system. So the, to drive, to, to deal with this complexity and to deal with the, 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 the dynamic parts of IT is the fact that, you know, I've got, I've got to be able to get my applications out. And the key challenges, when we've talked to a number of our customers, really stem around four key areas. Number one, lack of API testing. What's actually happened is the fact that, you know, too many bugs are escaping downstream. And as they move out in that direction, they become more and more difficult to fix, and they definitely become more and more uh, expensive to fix. So that's one of the key challenges, you know. How can I start doing more API testing while the code's actually being developed? The second one is lack of automated testing. And this becomes very crucial because, you know, more and more people are having to make small changes. And if I have to do the same exact manual testing, you know, you start raising those questions now. You know, what steps can I um, omit? What steps can I actually skip over? Mainly because of the fact that, um, you know, I have to get this out. So <coughs> from the automated testing side, you know, more and more needs to be introduced. More and more customers are moving in this direction, but it's still something in, in an area where testing is done, you know, completely manually. The third one is basically visibility into the production apps. You know, what is the customer actually seeing? You know, how does that particular application work in production? 
you know, gather that information, the path, the, um, the, the different parts of the code are taken or the data taken. How can I get that information back to the developers so it can help them do a, a better job at, at developing applications and getting them out quicker? And last but not least, you know, lack of release and environment automation. You know, it's just taking us too long to get a release out, and today's really what we're going to talk about. So the rest of the presentation, I'm going to concentrate, you know, on the release deployment side of things. So moving forward, the fact that, you know, let's identify the problem, or what do we think the problem is. Uh, starting from the point where the business, or somebody has an idea. You know, I've got this great idea, and I'm pretty sure this great idea is going to generate lots of revenue. So the key part is the fact that, you know, how do I get this great idea? to drive business value or get it out into the public so I can actually start to receive business value. And today, just about anything that happens in the business eventually is going to trickle down and get to the IT department. And that usually means the fact it's going to start in development. So I have this idea, I pass it to my developers, and I basically said, right, we've got to get this thing out to the business. We've got to get this thing out to the public. And that sort of translates to getting it in production. So how do I get this, this new idea from development out to production as soon as possible? And basically what this translates to, if we're talking about a web application, you know, developers put something together, it's now been added to the web application, you know, how quickly can Billy Kiefer, when I log on to my browser, see that particular feature in my browser? Once I see it, then that's production and it's out to the business. So again, more and more innovation is needed. And in and we're back to those two key words that we in IT always hear, you know, quicker and less cost. So now we've got to get to the point where, yes, I need more innovation, I need more and more innovation, and when I have this innovation being driven down to IT, we've got to be able to get it out quicker, and we've got to keep our costs down. Now, these groups haven't been sitting around doing nothing. You know, development, you know, over the number of years, we've moved into agile development, you know, more and more companies are starting to do testing and automating the testing and even continu continuous integration to make it easier and better to actually bring code together and get it out uh, much quicker. From the production side, you know, probably from the early 2000s, more and more companies uh, are starting to virtualize their servers. They're, they provision these servers. And I've got configuration management in place that basically says, you know, that server should be a web server, therefore, you know, make sure it is web server. So again, from the development side and from production side, a number of things have been put into place over the years to try to speed up this, this idea of getting something from development into production. So now the big question comes to, you know, why is this still taking so, so long? You know, why does this process take months and even weeks, or weeks and even months to get out? So we start to backtrack and try to figure out, you know, you know how can I actually prove this? You know, how can I actually make it so I actually speed up this process? And what we've come across is sort of three main areas. Number one, from the point of view when, you know, a survey was taken, when a release fails, 60% of the time when the deployment, I'm sorry, let's back up. So when the deployment or when a new application gets rolled out and it fails, 60% of the time that failure is due to a release error. You know, Somebody forgot to, to copy across the configuration file, or somebody forgot to update a parameter, you know, even a, a port number. You know, simple things like that just get missed. And it basically boils down to, you know, everybody's rushing around to try to get it pushed out as much as possible. You know, even a simple task can be overlooked, but that simple task has uh, great ramifications. Long time to market. You know, the window when you can actually do this testing is getting smaller and smaller. So the deployment process is taking longer and longer. You basically run out of time. You know, at a point where you think, okay, we're going to start late Friday, somewhere along the line comes maybe late Sunday. If I can't get it all in, then I've got to roll it all back. I've missed time. You know, I've missed that opportunity to actually get that new application out into the marketplace. So it becomes more and more critical the fact that when I start the deployment process, you know, I've got to make sure it fits into my ever ever shrinking time scales. And last but not least, you know, high cost. And this sort of covers a number of areas. Number one is the fact that you have a lot of highly paid technical people spending a lot of time with releases, you know, doing deployments and so forth, when they should be part of the innovation process. And also the fact that if you do miss 
a deployment schedule. You can't roll out that new application. That revenue that you're actually looking for is postponed, so that actually gets pushed back as well. So those are sort of, sort of three key areas where we've seen, you know, where why it's taking so long. The fact that, you know, the number of release errors, you know, errors that, you know, are, are just simple mistakes. Long time to market because the deployment cycles are taking too long and high cost. So what we're actually striving for is the fact that, you know, continuous delivery. We're very good in, in our line of business and IT of coming up with the different terms to, do, to mean different things. So the idea of continuous delivery is the fact that I want to shrink my deployments down to days and ultimately into minutes, but I'm not going to bypass anything. You know, I'm still going to push the deployment to development. I'll do my testing there. You know, I'll push it out to integration, UAT, performance, production. I'm still going to do exactly what I know I need to do. It's just that we're going to speed it up. And we're going to speed it up because a good part of that, can, we can automate the processes. Now, I might not go through every particular development or environment, you know, I'll go through the ones that actually we needed. But whatever I do, it's automated. And by automated, the fact that it actually can be pushed out in a standard way. And I'm confident in the fact that <coughs> when that deployment takes place, it's actually been done successfully. So I'd like to sort of take a step back now and, and you know, sort of deal with the idea of an application. What really confuses people, or even from the business side, you know, they see an application as being something simple. You know, a, a web browser, I've just launched a screen, that's my application. But when you sort of dig down in, you have to look at it from the point of view of what does that application actually touch? You know, uh, most applications today are probably going to have some type of uh, application server, you know, from, uh, you know, the Java, the WebLogic, the WebSphere, JBoss, or maybe even, you know, for the .NET um, into, um, into Microsoft Application Server. Um, we've got web servers. You know, we've got database servers. There's probably not a single application out there that doesn't have a database attached to it. And there are a number of other engines that are out there that basically, you know, uh, play a part in the overall applications. You know, it could be CRM systems. You know, it could, could be, uh, you know, uh, lookup tables. Any number of things where that you can run. So that's one layer. But in front of that, just a, a majority of times, you know, I'm going to have a, a load balancer. I'm going to have a mechanism that I can authenticate whoever's actually logging into my system. You know, who are they? Do they have access to the system? And I might actually present my customers with a portal. And of course, then we're going to have a, a number of, of um, middleware components, you know, an enterprise service bus and a number of repositories. So I have this infrastructure in place and all of this gets, could potentially be touched with this application. And then, of course, I have a, a, a long list of uh, platforms that I actually can put this on. So you almost have to think of it from a point of view. If, if I'm, again, sitting at home and I launch a browser and I go into an application, almost following that packet doing the snipper, you know, what does it actually touch? Because that's usually the parts of the application that need to be configured. You know, loading a jar file or loading a, a war file and in the application side, you know, server I could think about, BizTalk, you know, loading the .NET applications into there. That's a very simple part. You see all the other bits that get tied to that that become a bit more complex. So I now have my infrastructure in place, and these are the components that my application is going to touch. So the next step to sort of think about is, you know, what am I going to deploy? You know, the fact that, you know, I have to deploy a number of artifacts. I might have in-house developers. You know, so I have, you know, a development team, I've got two development teams, maybe three development teams. Or it might be a case of, you know, I outsource part of my product to out to uh, an outsourcer, and they're going to do a bit of it. Or it might be a simply a case of I outsource all of it. But the key thing here is the fact that once something's developed, the output of that development is going to be an artifact. It's going to be something that I actually want to deploy. So now I'm going to start my deployment. And the first thing I'm going to want to do is roll it out into my test environment because I need to do the testing. Now here I could do automated testing or I could do manual testing. You know, the ideal or the goal we're trying to achieve, we're going to talk automated. So I want to automate this testing. So when I'm happy, the fact that I've run through my tests, everything's successful, I'm ready to promote it. So I promote it to the next level, into acceptance. Into acceptance. Now here when things start to get a, 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 a bit more difficult, because now I'm moving into a, another environment. And the majority of times, this environment is, is almost completely different from the test environment. 
you know, I could have a lot more servers. Um, the information or the systems I actually have access to are, are different. But the key bit here is the fact that and what makes it difficult is just that I have to now change my process to actually do this deployment in the acceptance system. And this is where things start to go wrong. So if I want to back up a bit, go back up the top here, what we're trying to achieve, when you think about each one of these boxes, the app server, web server, and database server, each one of those actually represents a group of people as well. Those people are in charge of their, envir of, of their basic silo in the environment. You know, they're the experts. They know what needs to be done. So what we want to do, and the ideal goal, what we want to do is, is to capture that knowledge and to put that knowledge into a process and build out that process so that I use that process to do tests and I use that process into acceptance. And then ultimately, I'm going to roll that same process and roll out my, um, my artifacts or my release into production. So what I'm looking for here is a zero touch. That's the ultimate goal, is the fact that once I start this process, however I may start it, it's actually going to go through the different environments. It's going to be tested. If the test fails, it's going to be rolled back, go back to the developers, give me some new artifacts, do the test over again. When I go to acceptance, I'm using the same exact artifacts. You know, I'm using 2.0 or 3.0, and then ultimately I'm going to get to production. So the key here I'm trying to drive forward is the fact that when you get to the deployment part of it, the deployment of a release, it should not be part of the equation when you actually want to decide to write your roll out a release. It should be a given. You know, the fact that, you know, the, the, the large um, dot coms, you know, they talk about rolling out, you know, hundreds, maybe a thousand a day. How many you roll out is irrelevant. It's to a point where you roll out how many you need to roll out in the test and accept in production, but you're confident every time you do it, that deployment will be done successfully and it'll be done the correct way. So what I want to really talk about now is what sort of makes up the release automation, release auto operation side of things. And what's important to understand is the fact that automation is very, very important. So it's the how. You know, how do I actually build out my process and my manifest? The manifest here are the, are the parameters that actually go into the process. So I build this out. And most people think of automation as just this. You know, it's a process. I have an orchestration tool. I do things in this orchestration tool. But there are a number of things that are just as important. Number one is the environment. You need to fully understand you know, the makeup of that environment, the configuration of that environment. Because as we all know, very few companies, if any at all, have the same production system and all their environments. So why I have to understand the environment is the fact that I have to understand, you know, what do I actually do, what do I actually have to roll out? The fact that, you know, production has 25 servers, I've got four in test. You know, how do I manage that? How do I make sure the fact that when I do run in test, or I run in um, integration testing or UAT testing, I have the right configuration information? And even from the point from the server management, you know, what role does the server play? You know, to the point where if I have a, a database server and an application server, can I put both those servers or both those logical representations of those servers on the same physical server? So I need that control. On the what side is basically, what am I deploying? You know, I need to keep track of the fact that I've just deployed something to test. Where is it? You know, what's actually been put there? And then tracing that information as well, or watching the promotion of that information as it moves forward into different areas. So I've got the, the how, the where, the what, ultimately the when. There's a lot going on in testing and even in production. I need to be able to schedule. I need to be able to see a schedule as to what's actually happening so I can fit in my particular rollout and it's not going to conflict with any other rollout or any other deployment. Integration is important because of the fact that once you start getting into production, and I'll talk about this a bit later on, you know, it might be the fact that you know, change management needs to get involved here. There are a number of rules that have to be in place before something can be rolled out. You're not going to ditch those when you start to, to automate or to orchestrate you know, a, a new release deployment. So, so, so both scheduling and integration becomes very important. And last but not least, you know, it's the roles. You know, what role do you play? Are you the application owner? Are you the process builder? You know, Billy Kiefer can build out a process, but I can't run it in production. You know, the permissions are in place to, to protect the system to the point where, you know, all the rules will actually be followed. So it becomes pretty important. <coughs> in fact, with the who, the when, the what, where, how, all of these make up release operations to a point where I can actually design and manage my process. 
I can control and execute those processes when they need to be running. I can gather information in terms of reporting what's been running. And of course, I can integrate with my, um, my third-party systems like maybe change management or even the CMDB to update and let people know what's going on. So ultimately, what I want to get to a point where my application operations are very adaptive. You know, I can dim this thing, I can mold this thing, I can beat this thing. It will do exactly what I need it to do. I have the intelligence to do it complexity. Complexity doesn't worry me because I know I can handle it. And then I have that rapid, repeatable, and reliable process, you know, that automation for my application operations. So it's key is the fact that all of these add up to the total, um, so the total solution. Anyone on their own is just a part of the solution. So let's move on to, you know, um, where we actually see customers today is the fact that uh, in, in a maturity curve, um, probably about 50 to 60 percent of people, you know, are just probably just above scripting, just below the, the G. Um, so when you think about the manual, this is the heroes. This is when you have good people and you depend on these good people. You know, and they do a damn good job for you. Um, it's just the fact that, you know, there's just so much going on in the day. You know, you have a time when you walk in, you know you need to do 10 things. When you leave by the end of the day, you haven't done those 10 things and you've actually added another five. You know, so people are actually starting to get bogged down. Scripting even gets to the point. You know, when you look at the scripting, it's the fact that, um, a lot of people do scripting. So that scripting, when you think about the bigger applications or the complex applications, script, um, applications today are multi-tiered. And when you're actually scripting, you tend to tie a script into a particular tier, the database side, the web server side, or application side. And then it starts becoming more and more complex. And then you get to the point where the script, sort of what was a simple script, because you want to do more with it, starts becoming you know, hundreds of lines of code and you're scripting your deployments, whether or not the, you know, writing code for the actual product. So the manual and scripting side of things, you know, a lot of people are there, they're looking to move forward. And the next step up is automation, and this is when the orchestration takes place. This is when I actually start to, you know, automate the process where, you know, these are maybe the steps that need to be done. That orchestration takes place, the steps are actually executed, I'm reporting on those steps, you know, I'm tracing those steps, I understand what's going on, and the ultimate goal going back up into um, continuous um, delivery is the fact that uh, we want to get to the point where, again, we're back to that zero touch. Okay? And then ultimately, I want to get the optimization. Now, optimization is to a point where you know, I want to constantly you know, send feedback back to the uh, you know, development or for operations. How do I improve things? How do I figure out you know, if my continuous delivery is taking you know, maybe a day to do to actually do a, a, a deployment? You know, how do I pass back information to make it even quicker? And when you think about it, all of that, and I sort of want to roll back a bit because I want to talk about scripting. When you start doing more and more on the scripting side, it becomes very, very uh, easy to sort of get, get lost in things when you actually start to write scripts for the complexity of things. And what I want to do is just show you a brief window. So if I, if I actually wanted to make a simple control between an application server and a database server, here I would just draw a line. You know, that could be hundreds and hundreds of lines of code. And this is where, we, where people are, are sort of butting up against, the fact that they've, they've maxed out, they no longer have time to write this code. So now, you know, we want, to, we, we want to simplify the process and make it as easy as possible to actually roll out a particular application. But to control the steps of that application. So if I, if I need the application server to run first and then the database server, a simple line here indicates that particular order. So we want to simplify the entire process. So when you have this automation, so basically what they're actually saying is, you know, speed up, reduce your errors, enable more frequent releases, reduce your costs, improve visibility. So that's the sort of demands that are coming down to the business, down to IT, and we're almost at a point where we're thinking, okay, well, how do I achieve this one? And that's what I'd like to spend the rest of the presentation sort of covering. So when you think about release automation, the first step is the fact that when you, um, what we talked about is, is the manifest driven deployment. And I'd like to run through sort of three parts of this particular uh, setup. The first one is the application model. Remember when I discussed the fact that I have my subject matter experts, you know, they know what needs to be done. It's just the fact that it's, it's, it's very silo based. So what I want to be able to do, I want to pull out that information and I want to build a model. I want to build a model that basically says this is the correct process that will actually drive a particular deployment for a particular application. So I build out my deployment logic and my flows, and I also have my server types. So 
So this is a logical represent a logical representation of where in fact these processes will actually run. For instance, you know, uh, I'll have a database server. So the database server will have a number of actions and flows that need to be run. You know, I have a, an application server, same, and I can maybe even have a web server. So that's where the, act, the information or that's where the processes will actually take place. The next one is environment data. I first of all have to start, you know, where is my environment? Is it internal? You know, do I have an internal data, <coughs> data center? Am I rolling out to Amazon? Or am I rolling out maybe to Azure or, you know, Rackspace or any other cloud environment? And then secondly, I need to understand the configuration. I need to understand, you know, what makes up this configuration? What's different? You know, things like the fact that, you know, that when I actually install something in the test environment, I might use different user IDs, user, user passwords. I might use different port numbers. All this information needs to be gathered up and is part of the equation. And the third part is the fact that I now have my application artifacts. I have my release type. Release type could be you know, like a full deployment or partial or incremental deployment or even maybe a hot fix. And of course my application, it has a, a configuration item as well. So now I have my three main components. I have my model. This is a fixed process. This process will be running for every environment. I have my environment data because each environment is different. And I have my release information, which is going to be pretty static as well. So now I want to do my deployment. So now I actually take that process, I take my configuration information, and I take my manifest information, this is the release information, and I push it out to integration, integration testing. When I'm happy there, I promote. So it's, it's again, you know, same manifest, same release data, the configuration information for the environment is different. My process is the same. So that dynamic part gets put into the process. Using the same exact process, I've now just rolled out the UAT. Again, promoting, I'm into performance. And ultimately, I'm moving out to production. So what I'm actually striving here is the fact that I'm using the same exact process. So as I'm testing my code in integration, UAT, performance, I'm also testing my deployment process. So when it comes time for production, when I roll it out, I know both of these are going to be in, in good shape. My code's good because I've done a, da I've done a, a, a lot of testing, and my, um, my deployment will be good because I've tested it in all these stages. So I've reached a point where really what I want to do is design once, build once, deploy many. So that's the goal, you know, re re reusability. So once I've actually done the deployment out there, just a simple screenshot to indicate, you know, what have I deployed? So now I have a promotion path or a pipeline that basically outlines, you know, what's actually happened. I, I now have a clear picture, you know, back to the what part. I now have a clear picture of, you know, what I have been rolled out in my different environments. And of course, each environment is different. And when I actually sort of roll out in a particular problem, there shouldn't be any difference from the, maybe the release side of things. There's always a chance that something's got different. Very quickly, I can actually do a compare of one deployment and then another deployment in a different environment, figuring out, you know, what's the difference, and this might help, you know, if there are any problems, you know, determine, you know, why do I have this problem? It's because, you know, you're using a different configuration file. You know, something that's very simple that tends to get overlooked can actually be picked up very quickly and very easily. So let's take it up another step. Let's talk about the orchestration, the release orchestration. We understand the bits in the middle. You know, you now uh, understand the fact that you know I've built out my application model. I understand my different environments because they're all they're all going to be slightly different, but I, I have that under control, and I have my release data. But what becomes very very important is the fact that you know this isn't done in isolation. <coughs> there are a number of different tools out there that you're basically going to integrate with, and sort of starting in the top right hand corner, you know, you see the Jenkins and the Bamboos and Maven. So basically. The first step is, is to work out, you know, continuous integration and build automation. Now, this is sort of the start of the chain. So the, uh, the build will actually happen. The configuration integration will take place. The CI servers will basically drive everything. And the output of that is going to be an artifact. And that artifact needs to be stored somewhere. Now, there are a lot of repositories out there today, open source, as well as um, proprietary. Um, some people, you know, are happy with just using a, using a simple file share. But the next step is the fact that that's how I, I, I have my build, 
I have my artifacts. I'm not going to store them in the repository. So now I have a place where everything actually gets put. Now if I have to go back and build or rebuild that or um, again kick off another uh, uh, a CI process, then the artifacts will be repopulated. The next step up is the fact that you know I'm going to do some testing. And again, there are a number of testing tools out here. And by no stretch of imagination <laughs> have I included all of them. You know, I, I've left out plenty and there's loads of others. But the testing tools sort of get put into place. The key part here is the fact that you know, it's the drive to get that test, to get it into a, an automated stage. You know, you, you want the, um, the release deployment to drive your testing. It can actually talk to the Seleniums, you know, talk to the HP systems, you know, understand that the test run, yes, that it completes successfully, yes, right, we're ready, to, we're ready to promote forward and move on. So this is where, you know, automated testing plays a big part in the whole continu continuous delivery lifecycle. Moving on a step, the fact that you know you've got the um, NIMSOFT sort of HP and service now from the um, change management point of view, because like I said, the fact that a lot of companies today have very strict change management policies, and they're there for a reason to make sure things you know are, are approved and things get done in the right order and the correct things get done. That's not going to change. So again, the integration of the deployment process is, will interface with the change management system. And then over moving over to the right hand side, you know infrastructure. We've been provisioning infrastructure for quite a long time. You know, VMware has been around since uh, probably uh, early 2000. You know, System Center from Microsoft, you know, Service Mesh, providing out to the cloud. So here are the fact that, you know, it might be a case in, in a pre-initialization step, I need to be able to provision my servers. And maybe even more important, I need to go out there and check to make sure my servers are up and running and there are the correct operating system, the correct um, sort of CPU status, the correct memory status before I start my deployment. Because there's nothing worse than the fact that you're all ready to go, you push the go button, and you get out and find your servers aren't ready. And the last one on the list is one that's becoming more and more popular with the um, configuration management, the Chef, the Puppet, and CF Engine. Here again, the fact that, you know, these tools are actually driving configuration management. You can actually set them up to say, right, this server is a JBoss server, you know, this server is a web, uh, web logic server. So again, the integration process works on principles of the fact that, you know, I can, uh, we can drive uh, the configuration management tools to make sure the environment is correct and it's exactly what we require. And again, once this is all set up, <coughs> again, I'm driving my, my motion path, you know, I'm pushing out software to the INT, I'm pushing it out to UAT, I'm pushing it out to performance, and then ultimately I'm going to get it out in, in, into production. So this is the key part, you know, the fact that you can't sort of do things in isolation. There are a lot of different tools in the deployment cycle and you need to integrate with each of those tools or each of those tool groups. So now what I really want to do is just walk you through a, a very simple scenario. So I'm sitting at a, a console and this is sort of a semi-automatic, semi the fact that this is show you. And today I've decided I need to do a release promotion or at least to kick off a release promotion. And my first step is during, during an initialization process, I'm going to go out and retrieve my artifacts. In this particular case, I need some SQL statements. I need some configuration. They just have to be stored in Subversion. So I'm going to go um, pull that information out. Um, I have a, a war file uh, full of Java code that's basically sitting on network share. I need to pull that into as well. So now from the, the, the initialization part, I'm going to go out and gather up my artifacts. And this is all done because I've built a package that says, you know, for this particular build, it will consist of this particular artifact package. And in this artifact package, I will have these artifacts. The next stage is staging. And this staging could be pretty simple. But it also becomes very important, the fact that if you start building out some pretty big applications and artifacts, we've talked to some customers who could be pushing out one or two gigs. So if you actually want to start something Monday morning, what you don't want to do in the deployment process is wait a couple hours for the actual artifacts to show up. So you can actually stage these. And it becomes very important as well if maybe um, your developers are offshore. So you actually need to be able to get the artifacts from them, stage them sort of locally, so when you actually do come time to kick out the deployment, all your artifacts are exactly where they should be and I'm ready to go. <coughs> so now I've got the point where I've, I've got my artifacts. In this particular case, I have run through a staging. I've actually pulled everything in. Everything's local, ready to go. So now I'm going to run my deployment. So the first thing I'm going to do is do a verification. You know, is my environment, my INT environment there? 
is it set up correctly? Yes. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to configure my uh, F5 load balancer. And then I'm going to deploy my Jetty JBoss application. And then I'm going to actually do a, a database update. I'm not going to, you know, I need to uh, put SQL statements into a particular database or update the, um, the schema itself. And last but not least, I'm going to do a post-deployment verification. So these are the five steps that I've designed to actually configure, or these are the five steps that will take place every time I do this deployment. So these five steps will happen in, 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 uh, in integration testing. So the next step up is UAT. Now the nice thing about this is, is the fact that in UAT we decided, you know, we won't really be using any load balancer. So although that logic is there, it's determined the fact that the rule book says, you know, if you run in UAT, this particular process or this particular actions or these particular steps, you know, will not take place. You know, it's a very simple way of actually controlling the overall process. So the next step up is when I do my performance testing, then I definitely want my load balancer back in. So now that logic, because I've, I understand my, my environments, my configuration environment, they all play a part in the process that actually gets kicked off and run. So the last thing we tend to go into is the fact that uh, once I finish my performance, I'm ready to go in production. But of course, this is when the approval gates sort of kick in. The approval gates are basically saying, you know, we need a number of tick boxes ticked before I actually can push it in production. And this is where sort of the con uh, continued delivery sort of, um, sort of stops, you know, wait for um, somebody to OK this one. And then once it's OK, I actually push this out in production. But when you think about it, you know, this is a very simple production environment here. The fact that, you know, when do you actually, you know, shut down a production system to upgrade it? You know, the answer is going to be you don't. You just can't afford that. So when you think about it in terms of when you actually do roll out this one, you want to make it to the point where, you know, it's fail safe. You know, it's belt and braces. And this is where you sort of get into, you know, the terminology, you know, maybe do a canary deployment or a blue-green deployment. So the fact that what I'm actually doing is when I deploy it, sort of automatically, you know, a right mouse click says, I only want to deploy to 50% of the servers, first of all. So I'm going to deploy to 50%. And then I'll be able to maybe do a, a bit of testing. And when that testing is complete, I'll do the other 50%. And obviously, when that testing is complete, then I'll get to the point where it's back to full production. So now I actually have a system where I've actually started out from step one. I pull in my artifacts. You know, I've run my deployment. I run that fixed deployment. You know, that process isn't going to change. So I'm confident in the fact that that same process for that deployment, be it an INT, UAT, performance, and ultimate production is rock solid, and I have all the moving parts, the dynamic parts of our manifest, the understanding exactly the configuration involved, involved in that integration. So really, we're at a point now where I'd like to sort of <coughs> drill down in and have a look at maybe, you know, what's actually going on behind the scenes. And this is just a very simple picture of every sort of box in here is an action that needs to be done. No scripting. The fact that, you know, sort of look at it, in fact, if I were to drill into one of these, I actually see a panel, in the case of filling in the blanks. What you see for the source path and target path are parameters. And this is where the dynamic part happens. It's the fact that, you know, from the source path, the artifact file, the, um, the solution, the ideal way of doing it is when I gather my artifact from the staging point, this will actually be pushed to a local device. So all I have to understand is the fact that, you know, a parameter points you to where those artifacts are at, and then I'm going to copy these to a particular temp file. So all this information, the dynamic part, gets handled from the manifest side. So each particular environment will have its, its, its particular values that go into the, uh, into the manifest. This is all handled dynamically and automatically. And just another example, the fact that, so look in the right-hand corner, is the fact that, you know, I'm actually deploying a JBoss application. And again, you know, it's no scripting. It, it's filling in the blanks. And something that makes it much easier is the fact that, so when you look at the picture here, you see a, a, a simple tick mark here. This is actually a loop. So I'm actually deploying, you know, five uh, different um, JBoss applications, all from just answering, you know, one, two, three, four, four questions. Where, you know, what's my home path? What's my IP address? You know, what's my controller part? And what's my application path? You know, so I've deployed or dynamically deployed my application to this environment without actually doing any scripting. <coughs> so when you think about it, I want to get to the end here. When you, when you talk about, you know, the idea of no scripting, the fact that, you know, you, 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 you deliver applications, I'm sorry, you deliver actions 
to make it easy for people to actually deploy these actions in a, in a, in a flow, and then ultimately, you know, you build these out to a, a, a process. These actions, you know, it becomes very important, the fact that, you know, how do I make sure I, I, I'm communicating with all the potential different integration points? You know, uh, an agile development cycle set up, the fact that, you know, after, after every particular agile scrum gets built up, a number of actions will actually be generated and pushed out to the field for a, a number of well-known integration points. And we actually would really want to get to the point where, you know, maybe a customer has decided, you know, I like to write my own actions. So a nice simple tool that allows them to, to take an idea and to write their own actions. So again, you know, I'm getting rid of the scripting side of things. It makes life much, much easier. So those tools are actually provided out there. So the key part here is the fact that, you know, I understand that, you know, I might not be able to eliminate scripting 100%, but the goal is the fact that if, if I have an action, I have a library of actions, and now I simply drag and drop those actions. So this gets back to my, my original screen on the application side of things. When I have my subject matter expert who understands what needs to be done, so they actually take the actions, connect them into flows, build those out into processes, and now I link those processes to the different groups because one of the worst things that, that tends to take a lot of time is the fact that once a database team does something, you know, how do they communicate to the application server, how do they communicate to the network guys, you know, that time that's wasted no longer has to take place. It's the fact that the processes are in place. I can run those simultaneously. If I need to run them sequentially because that's just the best way they do it, that's what actually happens. And I do all that based on action. So really what I do is just want to, want to close here sort of for, for food for thought. You know, when you think about what we've just covered, you know, you, also, you start to ask yourself, you know, how much scripting do you currently do? You know, how much of it is actually taking up, you know, a, a lot of your time? You know, how quickly can you adapt to change in the environment? The fact that if you have to do a deployment from a, a test environment to maybe a staging environment, to maybe a QA environment, you know, how much effort goes into uh, setting up that environment and in making changes to be able to actually make that deployment out in that particular environment. And last but not least, it's like how many people are involved with each release deployment. And I don't mean the person who's actually keying in the keyboard. It's the fact that when you roll one out, back to one of my original screens when I showed you all the different um, parts of uh, the infrastructure that get touched, each one of those have a group of people. All those people are actually part of the, the release process. I've worked with the companies, you know, over the weekend and watched the number of people coming in. So it takes up a lot of their time, and that's where cost comes in. And I'm sure if you're thinking here, you have a, a lot more questions or a lot more ideas about maybe where you can actually start to work to drive the automation. You know, so the ultimate goal is the fact that we are looking for the zero touch. You might not get there today. You might not get there tomorrow. And again, you know, it, it, it won't be for all your applications, but it's a starting point. We want to get to the point where once it starts, deployment's done. My testing is done all automatically. I promote that through the different stages or my different environment, and ultimately I roll it out in production. Once it's out in production, I'm confident that the release is successful. Therefore, I'm confident that the code is there. I've tested the code, and I'll have a very successful application and a successful application deployment. So I want to thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to listen to me talk. Um, uh, I know um, there, there are a number of, of questions that have come in. So um, let me uh, just have a, a quick pause here. Uh, the first question is, shouldn't performance tests be built into the build rather than a separate post-UAT phase? A very good question. And this is where sometimes when you actually build out a PowerPoint, it becomes very difficult to actually um, sort of indicate the process. When you think about a performance testing, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different code that actually get tested before it actually gets out out of development. You know, from the CI integration, where we work with people, the fact that uh, we can build out environments, or environments can be built out, so the developers can test it before they've actually checked in their code into the final, uh, you know, target branch. So yes, you know, I, I agree. It, it, performance testing is done at a number of different stages. There's probably not just one set point that's done. It's just that from my particular picture, it was just uh, ideal in simplicity and very linear, and it just shows that's what I was trying to indicate. It, 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 is, it is one of the many environments that you have to deal with. Does release automation integrate with most major builds and configuration tools? 
Um, obviously, somebody who's coming maybe from the development side, another good question. That's usually the starting point. When we've talked to a number of our, 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 <coughs> our customers and our clients, most of them have a, a CI tool of some sort that's driving that build process. You know, monitoring how the, the monitoring how the build gets done, the different plugins. Um, so yeah, so when you think about it, how we sort of broke it down is the fact that uh, continuous integration is really the first step of continuous uh, delivery. Um, so yes, we see um, uh, the, the the CI server played a big part, and a lot of our integration points are with those CI servers. So what they actually do, when they actually do the build, maybe the last part or post-build step would be to invoke a release automation tool to go build out the environment, get the artifacts, put those in that particular place, and then continue your testing. So yes, I totally agree with you. What are the major challenges most people you talk to have? Very, very, very good question. You know, a, a lot of times, some people try to um, over, make things a bit too um, too complex. It, it's starting simple simple steps. When you think about it, uh, you know, there's lots of different phrases for you know, boil the ocean, you know, eating uh, an elephant one at a time, one one piece at a time. Most people come to us the fact that they don't know where to start. You know, it's at a point where you know, start something simple. It doesn't have to be all your application. The concept is the fact that, you know. Take an application, you know, one particular application that might be causing you major grief, and then start to work out, you know, what are the steps that need to be done to, to make this particular um, deployment of this application simpler. I think the number one sort of issue, I think a lot of companies we've talked to, they just try to do too much in one go, you know, walk and then run. So hopefully that's uh, that's giving you an idea. Right. Next question is capability within organization. From your opinion, what are the top five steps to get culture of DevOps? Oh, I'll tell you what. Uh, very, very good question. Um, five steps. Um, you ask. You ask a very good question. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's probably one that um, I need to sit here and take a, a big breath at the moment um, and to understand um, maybe what. Uh, where, where's the starting point? Um, so hang on a second. So the, the key bit here when we talk about DevOps is the fact that there are so many different definitions of what DevOps is about. It's, it's to get that understanding. It, it, a big part of step number one is the communication. It's trying to understand the fact that you know we are all we are all on the same side. It's the fact that you know development aren't trying to you know um, um, cause difficulties with operation. And operations aren't trying to be, you know, sticking in the mud and pushing back the development, saying, you know, no, we're not going to do that. So that's step number one. I, I tell you what, um, it's got to the point where we're almost back to the point where, again, you, you start small. You know, you, you, you don't try to overcomplicate things. And then you also, like I said earlier, you, you got to it. You got to get into that that collaboration. You got to get the groups talking and understanding the fact that, you know, how does one work? If I understand how you work. And you understand how I work, you know, we can work together. And that was one of the things, one of the, the, the bullet points for relation is, is visibility into the deployment process. You know, understand the fact that when I do have a problem, where exactly can I go look? And a key part as well is, is metrics and measurement. You know, at a point where you're thinking, okay, how do I know I'm improving? You know, I need to be able to gather those metrics. And again, part of the, 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 um, the deployment process the fact that you can gather information about how quickly your deployments are happening, how you know how many redeployments are failing. So I understand the fact that from a metric point of view, where do I stand, and am I getting better? And the key part, like a lot of things, is share things. You know, development. I I can't say it enough. Development has to trust operations, and operations have to trust development. Right. Next question is, what's the CA orchestration to provided on this particular platform? Okay. And and. and from this particular, <coughs> pardon me, the orchestration tool is, is part of our release automation solution. It's all rolled into one, and this becomes pretty important. The fact that, uh, as I said on one of my slides, you know, the fact that the, the, the five areas that make up release automation, orchestration is just one of those. So it's a built-in orchestration into the release automation tool that's been designed specifically for the idea of application deployment. It understands, you know, the different environments. It understands, you know, server types from a logical point of view. 
It understands the fact that you know from a web server a web server farm, you know if I build out a process, then I can run that process on 20 application, 20 web server um, farm um, servers at the same time, or I can run that and you know piecemeal running one at a time. So it's again it's an orchestration tool built into the product that understands application deployment. Okay, um, one second, please. Are we? Oh, wait, I don't understand the question. Okay, right. So I'm sorry. How do we how do we need to manage all configuration data from different environments like UAT, etc.? You know, do we need to start capturing this information? The thing about it is, what we found out. Most people know exactly what that information is. They, they understand the differences. The trouble is the fact that it's in everybody's head. It's not sort of documented. And in places where it is documented, it's on a run sheet. So now I'm, I'm handed a run sheet that basically says, you know, these are the slight changes that I need to do when I run from, you know, uh, uh, integration testing to UA testing. And, you know, I, easy, I, I skip the step. So what we're actually saying is the fact that you have that information what we want to do is quantify that information, even to a point where you know it's worthwhile putting that into version control. You can put it into a system like Subversion. So once it comes time to actually run the deployment, we know, for instance, if I'm running a new AT, I know exactly where to go to get the correct information. That information has been developed. It's been looked over by a number of people. I know that's the correct information, and I input that information into my overall process. So there's no guesswork here. You know, this is exactly what I need to know. I'll take that information, plug it into my processes, and everything will work correctly. All right, I got two more questions to go up. So let's. One is, what is required before the continuous delivery continuous delivery tool can be implemented? Okay, when you think about from a, a, a tool point of view, and if you, if you go across the entire sort of um, continuous delivery aspect of it, you're talking maybe two key aspects. Number one is the fact that a, a, an automation tool, release automation, actually doing the deployment. So I'll actually push out the deployment, or it will actually push out the deployment environment. The second key component is testing, okay, my automated testing tools. And this is where the maturity sort of kicked in. Remember when I talked about maturity being I have automation and I have continuous delivery. We still have a lot of our customers that are at the automation level. They're, all their testing is done manually. But then what they've set up is the fact that the deployments work. You know, deployment is kicked off Friday night, Monday morning when the testers walk in, no time wasting. The testers know exactly what they need to do because the product's been deployed and ready to run. In some areas, that's acceptable for right now. Eventually, you want to get to the point where you want to automate that testing. You want to get to the point where I deploy, I do my test, the test comes back to me and says it worked, fine, let's move it to the next one and then ultimately up to maybe just before production, then that's when the change management system kicks in. I, I could automate that process, you know, go out, send emails, contact a number of people, get the information, and then roll it out into production. So the two, the two key main points, as I see them, is the fact that release automation tools to actually drive the deployment and an automated testing tool to actually do the testing. Last question, is it possible to automate deploy complete environments, i.e virtual SQL servers, configure them, subsequently deploy the software, run the test, and clean up at, at the end. So that example, you know, start with an empty virtual server, build everything up, and then clean it up at the end. Wow, a good way to end a, uh, a, a, a webinar presentation. Exactly, we're, we're at Utopia. You know, that's a goal when you talk about from the environment point of view. When you think about the scenario, is the fact that First thing I do, in one of the steps I showed you, a pre-initialization step, I could dynamically go out, build my servers, even to a point where you know I can have policy in place that those servers basically determine where should they be, where should they actually be built out, you know, in Amazon or maybe internal. Once those servers are built out, I could actually invoke maybe configuration management to make sure the infrastructure is put on them. I even install Apache. You know, I've got JBoss. And then ultimately, you know, I pick up those IP addresses, I now add those IP addresses to my environment, and now I deploy my application. So yes, and we actually have, you know, customers who are almost at this stage and, and are doing this in some of their environments. So this is the ultimate thing. You know, start from a blank piece of paper, build out my environment, 
put my application on it, run it for as long as I need to run it. When that testing is done, or I'm finished with it, tear it all down, put it back into the resource pool, and uh, let somebody else use it. So that's definitely something that uh, is, is achievable. So I, I want to thank everybody for taking the time. Um, if we haven't been able to answer your particular question, you have my email address. We will actually get back to you. But you know, over the next hour or so on your way home, you know, if you think of something, you're thinking, yeah, should I should ask that question. By all means, feel free to, to drop me an email, and I'll, 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 I'll give you an answer back as soon as I can. So I want to thank everybody again for taking the time to, uh, to listen to me talk for about an hour here. So thank you very much, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you, Billy. Thanks for a most informative webinar this afternoon. It was great, actually, to see just so many questions coming at the end. It's certainly very thought-provoking. Just a couple of things to round up. Uh, just an uh, announcement, we have recorded the webinar, so if you'd like to share it or listen to the webinar again afterwards, the recording will be available very shortly. What we're going to do is email everybody with a, a link to it, so you'll be able to just, just download and, and listen to it. Now, the final part today is the draw for the iPad. So what we're going to do is just call out at random a uh, name of somebody who has attended the webinar. We're just going to do the draw now. Uh, we've got the names, and thankfully today we haven't got two people with the same name, which makes it a little bit easier. So we're just going to do the draw now. And the winner is Ben Maynard. So congratulations, Ben. We'll be sending, we'll be getting in contact with you and sending the iPad to you shortly. So thank you again, everybody, for attending. And Billy, thank you for a great webinar. Goodbye. Thank you very much.